So um, I'll, this is just the outline of my talk. So for the background, I'm just going to talk about a little bit of models that we built over the years and introduce the causal biological <coughs> network model database, CBIN. And then I will show our current workflow, how we build new models, especially the semi-automatic curation workflow we're developing. And then last, I will show how we use these models and our scoring to assess our new products. So we have been building these models for years. And um, the, the purpose was to try to model the biology that happens in the lung. And we chose to build causal network models for several biological processes that take place in the lung and that can be perturbed by toxicants in uh, particular cigarette smoke. And first we had the first 80, uh, 98 network models. They were published in, uh, or presented in six original publications. And six of them were cardiovascular context or vascular context. And then we went on and we consolidated the models a little bit and we added some uh, mechanisms that are uh, characteristic for COPD to have, <coughs> have a disease model and the models now are hosted in this website that's there's the, the, the address is on top and these models are encoded in Bell so here you can see that <coughs> you can go you can look at the model you can take any edge you want you can look at the details so you will see the Bell statement behind you see the context, you see all the evidences, which are uh, the text captures from the publication where it was extracted, and you can go to the original, back to the original article. And yes, and then there's an extensive annotation, so there's a species and the disease context for most of the edges. And these uh, models are kind of uh, special because they were built in, with very specific boundaries in mind, which means that we really aligned biological processes and we took only signaling pathways that were involved in that biological process and uh, we build models for proliferation, stress, uh, cell fates, etc. And then there are also several models that are cell type specific so there are specific biology represented for for instance immune cells. And then uh, the way the CBIN works, you can actually go there, you can download the models, you can download a CIF file, which means that you have all the nodes and edges of the model in an Excel format. You can also download a JSON graph file that you can upload to Cytoscape and visualize it, modify it, and look at it into more detail. Now this I will not talk about because Natalia will talk about our network verification challenge. So in essence, we just, uh, gave the network to the crowds and they were um, reviewing them, but Natalie will give much more detail. So this is the architecture on the CBIN. So first we have the network model building occurrence, and then the network models are uh, stored in the Mongo repository that can talk with the Bionet website, which is actually the crowd verification platform. And then this is the front end, this is a CBIN, where you can work on the models. There are many different things you can do and ways you can view them. And you can always go back to the evidence source, which is the original publication that the statement was extracted from. Okay, so now I will then, we keep building these, these models that I just showed here in the CBIN, they were built in collaboration with Selventa. But now we keep building our own models and we have developed this uh, semi-automatic curation workflow that I will describe a little bit. So. Just the biological context, I will talk about a very brand new model that we recently built. And the motivation was to kind of uh, complement an adverse outcome pathway that we have designed for uh, mucus hyposecretion in uh, chronic bronchitis. So mucus hyposecretion is really a key manifestation in chronic airway diseases. So in a normal human airway, only 5% of the cells are goblet cells, and those are the cells that produce mucus. But in diseases, you can have the increase in the number of goblet cells, and you can have um, pathways that lead into increase of mucus hypersecretion, and this leads to impaired lung function, such as observed in uh, COPD. So the first uh, step in the model building is, of course, you go to the literature, and we do this the way Dexter 
wishes, <laughs> we think about the model we want to build. We collect articles that are relevant and we know that the articles have causal relationships because otherwise you can't script in Bell. So there are a number of ways you can curate. You have manual curation, it's very time consuming and it can all often vary between uh, independent curators. You can have purely automated curation that has a very high speed and efficiency. However, if you don't have the, the re, um, what is it called? The, um, the re recall and the specificity in balance, you may, first of all, you may have a, you may miss many statements in your article, or you can have an increased error rate. So as a solution, we are developing this uh, belief, which is a biological expression language information extraction workflow, which is a semi-automated solution. It has a text mining part, and there's an interface for scientists that allows manual uh, correction of the statements. So this is the uh, text mining pipeline. It has a na natural language processing tools. It has name entity recognition. It can extract um, relationships. And then from the original text document, it doesn't take PDF, but you have to give it a text document. It creates this Excel format. And then subsequently, you have a curation interface where Belief shows you the part of the text where it picked up entities and relationships. It proposes a Bell statement. It proposes annotations, which can be disease, species, or cell lines, whatever. And it allows you to correct it. You can say, OK, this is OK, or you can correct it to make sure that the statement is OK. And finally, you have a chance to export your Bell document. And you can do further review in this format. And after you have, uh, usually you get one Bell document per an article, and then you take them all and you compile all the Bell documents into this knowledge assembly model. And this you can view inside Escape, and this is now our MUKUS Secretion Network model, the new network model. You can review by looking at the biological processes that you need to see there, because you are trying to sing, uh, model signaling pathways that go to your, your end goal. You can also, in very detail, look at any edge you wish and go back to the paper and the statement where it came from. So this is part of the verification. So um, why we build these models? We want to use them to interpret transcriptomic data from our studies. And we want to do it in a specific biological context. So these models need to be scorable with transcriptomic data. So therefore, the models always have two layers. Some of the nodes in the model, the backbone nodes, underneath there's information about, about machine and RNAs that this node regulates. And this is all captured in literature or extracted from data sets. And so this allows you to, from transcriptomic data and gene expression changes, it allows you to infer activity of a node that has this downstream layer. And the algorithms uh, developed by <coughs> our computation scientist, it actually uses this inference and computes a network perturbation amplitude for the network as a whole. And it takes into consideration three different statistics. You have, it takes into consideration backbone topology, which means that if you uh, mix all the edges in the backbone and you get a score, it cannot be specific. Another thing that the downstream RNA nodes have to be in the right places, so if you just shuffle them around, you get a score. It's not specific. And thirdly, it takes into consideration experimental variability. So when you have uh, the three stars, it means that the NPA is OK, and it's um, specific. So for the net, net, um, goblet cell network model, we have tested it with transcriptomic data. So it was curated from literature. Some of the nodes have downstreams to allow scoring. And we used uh, two data sets. One of them is lung cells treated with this pyocyanin, which uh, causes oxidative stress and mucus production of the host cell, and it's EGFR mediated. So you can see that the network model responds to this transcript tome from this experiment. You have a high NPA score. And then we have another experiment where basal lung cells were differentiated in air liquid interface into this pseudostratified culture that looks like an uh, airway. And as you go 
uh, culturing in, uh, in the later stages when it really reaches the differentiated culture, you have the network responding. So this NPA score now is without sign. So it just says there's an impact or there is no impact. It's specific or it's not specific. But you can do more. It's a top-down approach where you can use a leading node analysis. And this analysis means that the leading nodes are the nodes in the network that when impacted are the most important for the score. So they count 80% of the score. So the leading node analysis can give you the directionality. So here are the top, I guess, 10 leading nodes. So you can see that the, always in the red, it's predicted to be positively regulated. So EGFR activity is inferred up. And another thing you can do with the leading node analysis, you can actually pinpoint the no, the leading nodes in the network, so you can put it back, you can go back to the network and you can, you know, look what the region is. And this is important for, let's say, mode of action studies, because you can have drugs with a similar effect, but on one network, one side of the network can be impacted by one drug and then another one by other. So it can be used for that also. And now here, when I put in this um, architecture picture, our belief would go there on the network model building. It's not by any means now integrated there yet, but that's what it serves, the belief. And so finally, I will, I will just show how we use these models on a real example. So I'm in the program of systems toxicology, where we try to combine classical toxicological endpoints with high throughput measurements and network modeling to assess the impact of a product on a biological system. So it starts by careful experimental design. You choose the model. You choose the, the endpoints that you would collect. You do statistical design and all of that. And then you collect uh, end, um, tissues for classical toxicological endpoints but also for transcriptomic analysis. We also do genomics, proteomics, and all of that, but with these network models, we currently only use transcriptomics data. So you pick the networks that are appropriate for your tissue in question, and then you do, as I described, we, do net, we compute the network perturbation amplitude. So here, just one example is, this is a switching study where we tested a new product on an animal model of a disease. And it was an eight-month inhalation study where the, the mice were exposed to fresh air, conventional product, or new product, or two, two months of, on, to the conventional product after which they were switched to fresh air or the new product. And this is transcriptomics data in the context of the biological network models. So we are scoring here tens of networks because we have so many networks for lung tissue that are, that are appropriate. So instead of showing the bar graphs that I showed before, we use this heat map presentation. So the redder, redder then the bigger the impact. And when there's the star, it means that it passes all three statistics. And then what finally we do, we've developed, or our computational people have developed this uh, biological impact factor, which means that you aggregate the NPA scores from all those networks into one holistic score. And this is what you show to higher management because it's easier. And you, you show the biological impact on the experimental design. So in summary, the, these causal network models, they have defined boundaries and they're fee freely accessible on the CBIN database. So please do visit the database and look at the models. The semi-automated correction workflow is now used to build new network models. And we use these network models for quantitative impact assessment. It's routinely. So the further development on the Billy platform is that we need to build a, the Bell Manager, which means that you can filter, you can do statistics on your Bell state when you can store your nanopubs. We're also including new namespaces and dic dictionaries because currently we can only use human, mouse, and rat context, but we will add other, other species. And we are trying to develop the compilation process inside the workflow. And we are continuously expanding the CBIN network model shoot with new network models. So with this, I would like to thank you.
for your attention and also the collaborators. So from our Systems Talks team in Neuchâtel, especially Julia Hong, who's the director, Stephanie Bu, who's responsible for building the CBNet website, Justina Zostak, who was driving force on the Belief project, and Stefano Vavasori, who was an intern and built the Goblet Cell Network model, and Florian Martinstein, who developed the scoring algorithms. And I would also like to acknowledge Fraunhofer Sky, which is very imperative. They work on the text mining part. They do all that work on the uh, text mining for the Belief. Metisox is a company that we use for curation, so they use Belief platform routinely, and then they give us feedback on it. And ADS, uh, was responsible, I think, for the visualization in the CBIN, and they worked on the CBIN website. And of course, Selventa, that was our collaborator in the past, that we started all these efforts. Thank you. Thank you very much.